study, Brazilian Atlantic rainforest is an incredibly diverse, yet um, highly threatened global ecosystem. I went to the southeast of Brazil for three weeks last May, and the trip was based around the states of Rio de Janeiro and Minas Gerais. So it's a great opportunity to, uh, to visit a tropical country. I've never really had the chance to do this before. Uh, so I'd like to thank the following people, uh, the Ernest Gaunton Smith Trust for providing the funds. So the people at Kew and in Brazil, um, in particular Marcelo, for getting the project up and running and providing me with the first contact out there, which was Juliana Grin at in your team tank garden. I uh, also thank Tom, who's here at the back somewhere, a uh, good old friend of mine who came along with the experience. So it's obviously much uh, less daunting travelling around with someone that you knew. The talk will be split into two sections. Uh, this is based on the travel objectives set out in the initial um, travel proposal. The first section will be about the Atlantic forest itself, the, the climate, the history, and uh, section two will be looking at some gardens in the region. Um, some planting styles and also some of the conservation work that the, the gardens are involved with. Uh, so Brazil is an, um, an enormous country. It's in South America and it borders every single country in South America except for Chile and Ecuador. Um, it's actually over 8 million kilometres squared and it's the fifth largest country in the world both in size and in population. So within it, because there's such a huge range of latitude, there's actually six completely differing biomes. In the northwest, the Amazon. Um, in the center, the Cerrado. Uh, Cerrado is a tropical savanna. Up in the northeast, you have the um, Cartinga, which is very dry, very arid. And um, Pantanal in the west, the wetland. On the border of Uruguay in the far south, a temperate pampas grasslands. And then you have this Atlantic forest which goes all the way up the east coast and into um, Paraguay and Argentina as well. So the, the forest is um, formed on a series of mountain chains and it's these mountains are the main influence in flora. This is different to the Amazon because in the Amazon the main influence are the water bodies within the forest. So what happens is the, um, the moisture gets blown in from the Atlantic Ocean this hits the mountains and rises, and then um, you get between 2,000 and 3,000 millimetres of rain each year. And because of this, and um, kind of light levels that come in through the, the varying canopy levels, it creates a lot of diversity. And it's one of the um, world recognised diversity hotspots, and there's over 20,000 species, 40% of which are endemic. So the map here just to show the situation for the forest now. Um, it's now incredibly fragmented, as you can see. In dark green, you have the, um, the areas of current forest cover compared to that kind of lighter green color as it was um, around 500 years ago. And the table shows just what incredible endemism there is um, right through the plant and animal kingdom. So plants around 40% and something such as amphibians is over 60, although I've read somewhere else this might be more like 90. So, uh, these aren't my photos, these ones, but um, these are some of the kind of poster friendly flagship conservation species, um, all endemic, all highly threatened. There's four different species of golden tamarind monkey, um, then you have a maimed sloth, woolly howler monkey and a jaguar. Uh, of course, all of these animals are completely reliant on the, the resources um, that are provided by the, the plants in the forest. And one of the main problems for forests is that people have also been very reliant on these as well. So, the main reasons for the current um, deforestation uh, to begin with was timber, then through the 18th, 19th centuries, um, coffee and sugar plantations. Um, mining in the south, particularly for gold and for iron ore. And um, today the biggest threat is urbanization. So in this eastern region, over 80% of Brazil's GDP is generated, and over 70% of people live there. 
and this is because there's um, enormous cities such as Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. Some challenges not stopping this, but in, um, rather working towards a um, more sustainable outlook on, on many different industries. So within the Atlantic Rainforest domain, there's several different <coughs> ecosystems. Uh, behind me is a very a broad model that I put together to show this. And as you come in from the Atlantic Ocean, move up through the mountains, you get these different habitats. So um, along the coast, you might have mangrove forests or the Restinga, which is an area I'll show you. Then you get sub-montane, montane, montane um, which is mountain forest, evergreen mountain forest. As you move further inland, it becomes semi-deciduous. And also further south, there's um, Oracaria and Gustafolia forest. But this is, again, incredibly threatened, but you get this at higher altitudes. And right at the top, there's these high altitude grasslands. Um, so there's very few trees up here that have a very moist environment with lots of grass, grasses and bamboos. So um, this is just west of Rio de Janeiro, um, near Barra de Guarachiba. It's Perenia Beach. And it's one of the few areas you can see this unprotect, I mean, protected um, coastal region called the Restinga. It's a sandbank ecosystem, it can go for around five kilometers inland. And the flora is heavily influenced by the sea and high salt levels, high light levels, uh, wind, and also sandy um, free draining soils. So some of the flora typical of this region, um, glossy evergreen shrubs, such as Eugenia brasiliensis. Um, Eugenia is a plant a genus worth mentioning, there's more species of this in the world than there are any other tree and shrub. And you also get a lot of succulents such as this um, Ceres dinambicensis, um, cat daisy family. So lots of cactus and lots of um, bromeliads, particularly to Lancia species. <coughs> so moving up into the mountains, this is Itachi Aya National Park. Um, a perfect place to go and see the montane forest. Uh, it's the oldest national park in Brazil. It was opened in 1937. So it covers a huge range of altitudes, right from 700 to 2,700 metres. And the scenery there is incredible. Um, plenty of, well, there's a few different rivers that run through, which are an important water source. And um, you get these kind of granite boulders. Uh, the whole forest is on crystalline rock, granite and gneiss. And uh, incredible diversity all around, both in the flora and fauna. About halfway up, there's a museum which you can go in, which tells you all about this as well. And so, um, incredible tree diversity. A recent study showed that in the space of it's only 2.5 hectares, there's actually around 2,000 species of tree. So there's no real dominant species, but you can see how it grows up this slope. Um, in the spring, this would likely be covered in kind of yellow, orange, purple flowers, um, yellow from the Vabaceae, Bignoniaceae flowering trees, and also the Tibachina from the Melastomataceae family. And this quote was from uh, 1500, so it's from the original Portuguese expedition when they first discovered Brazil. And this is written by the scribe writing back to the king, explaining what they'd found and the different landscapes that they saw. And so you can see, um, so it reads, the number, size, and thickness of these trees, and the variety of their foliage beggars calculation. So it would have looked like this over much of the coast, and almost immediately they, they kind of saw the potential for a lot of these trees, and many of them have got economic uses. So I'll show you some of these now. This is Po Brasilia echinata. It's recently changed from Ces Alpinia echinata as part of the legume family. And it's um, also known as a tree of Brazil. So it produces a red dye in the bark. And when this was brought back to Europe, they named the dye was called Brazil. And it's from this that the, the name of the country um, originated. Um, so this, this is a Gibson ES335, um, made from Brazilian rosewood. And 
Brazilian rose root comes from Dalbergia nigra. They've stopped using this now to make instruments and to make furniture, but it, um, so that's been prohibited, but it remains a, a critically endangered red listed species. So another red listed species um, I mentioned earlier on, the uh, Brazilian pine, or the Cary Rangustifolia. It's not actually a pine, it's um, more closely related to a monkey puzzle. And uh, this has also been harvested um, for timber, and also um, these nuts that it produces, which are edible, and when roasted, they taste a bit like, um, a bit like sweet chestnut. Uh, so the forest is kind of glittered with this palm, uh, Euterpe edulis. In the Tachiaia, this is highly abundant, but outside of these protected areas, again, it's, um, it's threatened. And um, this has been harvested for timber and also for palm harvest, which are a delicacy that you would have with a meal. But it's a really, really nice palm. I think we've got one in the palm house, um, a container, and it, it creates these amazing silhouettes and um, really, really nice ornamental species. So one plant that isn't threatened, but um, it's a good indication of, of deforestation, Cecropia, Pakistakia. This grows very quickly up towards the light. So if you see lots of these around, it's a good indication that the forest has been damaged at some point. But it's also very useful for, for reforestation projects, and it's a valuable source of food for slugs. Um, somewhat surprisingly as well, it's part of the Urticaceae family, which is the same family as the stinging nettle. Maybe the distinguishing feature of the Atlantic rainforest is the incredible amount of epiphytes, um, in particular bromeliads, so there's thousands of bromeliad endemic species. And you also get several ferns, um, orchids, and the trees are covered in lichen and moss, and climbing lianas, um, in particular from the Aeraceae, uh, Convolvulaceae, Pignoniaceae families. So right on the top of the mountains are these high altitude grasslands. Um, throughout all of these slides we're staying in this national park, with, um, in a hostel within the national park. And this was quite a long way away that we managed to, to source a lift with uh, some friends we made. And it was a completely different atmosphere, it was, um, it was much cooler. So it's actually autumn around this time of May. And uh, this is the only time where it really felt like it, it was around 12 degrees. Still very moist, um, barely see 20 metres in front of you, it's so misty. Uh, the rest of the time it was more kind of average, around 25 degrees, and it was very sunny. But the flora typical of this region is um, shrubs and trees, I mean shrubs but no trees, and uh, plenty of different grass species, alpines, and uh, this kind of shrubby bamboo, which you can see on the right, which is um, chuskia. So the next section is going to be looking at some of the gardens that I went to. Uh, this picture on the left is of a, a park in Belo Horizonte, a park in Municipal. It wasn't part of the itinerary, but it was the first um, open space that we really came across in Brazil. We flew into Rio and then straight away had to get a night bus up to Belo Horizonte, where we had a day to spend before going to our first destination. So this was um, quite an eye-opening park and it was our first real taste of tropical flora and palms and trees of this kind of scale. A beetle that you can see is um, one of several art pieces <coughs> in Instituto in your team, which I'll talk about towards the end. So I'll run through some uh, typical features of Brazilian gardens, tropical gardens in general. So rather than using herbaceous perennials, annuals, um, ground cover is tends to be evergreen, and it's planted more for the texture, uh, shape and colour of the foliage, and it's kind of mosaic patterns, uh, a bit like we might see in our uh, glass houses here. Um, so families used for that would be Bromeliaceae, um, Zingiberaceae, Heliconiaceae, and um, Acanthaceae. 
Then you have some incredible specimen trees. This perhaps was um, the standout performer. This is um, Enterolobium consortiquillium, um, again in the legume family. And the picture doesn't quite do it justice, actually. It really was massive. Uh, it's really huge, thick branches and stems. And that's uh, in your team. And a couple of others, there were loads of different um, ficus trees. I think for any tropical garden you'd want at least one of these in there. The, for the overground root systems, decorative bark. Uh, this is at the Berla Marx, Situ de Berla Marx garden. And then um, Kurapita guineensis, the cannonball tree. Uh, there's one of these in the, in the palm house as well. And it's in the same family as the Brazil nut. And it's um, known for these kind of large cannibal like fruits which go all the way up the main stem. So palms, um, it kind of blew my mind how big some of these palms were. Just uh, really vigorous, absolutely brilliant architectural palms. The uh, biggest is the Rostania Vashia. This is um, Cuban royal palm, native to the Caribbean. And they make really good avenues, uh, like this one in Rio de Janeiro, Botanic Garden. You can see them throughout the uh, cities as well, they're very majestic and they can actually grow up to 50 to 60 metres, which is higher than they would grow in the Caribbean. And this is because um, you don't have the same tropical storms here that you would do there. Um, other favourites of mine is Dipsis lasteliana, which is endemic to Madagascar, um, redneck palm, Bershafeltia splendida, um, these incredible stilt-like roots, um, and that's endemic to the Seychelles. When planted in a giant group like this, perhaps next to water in a, in a huge garden, they can have a really powerful impact if planted in large numbers. <clears throat> and this is uh, Bismarckia nobilis, um, another plant we've got at Kew, and this is endemic to Madagascar as well. So despite being autumn, there was plenty of flowers out. Um, Bourgainvillea, you can see throughout the national parks and the gardens. Um, it is native to Brazil as well as much of South America and it's a pink uh, wrapped which surrounds the flower that you can uh, make the colour and it grows really nicely up trees and pergolas and kind of separates areas out really nicely. Uh, Tibachina grandiflora, Tibachina is one of my favourite plants so it was, it was great to see plenty of these and um, a bulb near a daisy family near America, um, really nice flower as well. So, um, Roberto Berlamarx has been an incredible influence on Brazilian horticulture as well as conservation. Um, he was multi-talented, born into a very wealthy family. He was a um, talented painter, garden designer, um, musician as well, and he, he spoke out for the need to conserve the forests. Um, he was also one of the first designers to really celebrate using Brazilian flora in his designs. And uh, we were able to go to, to one of his gardens, which is actually where he used to live. So he built his home on an old banana plantation, and then, um, then built the garden to go with it. Here he had his huge collections of plants, which he would cultivate, put into cultivation for other gardens. And he was a, a recycler of materials, so his gardens would always be full of these kind of granite boulders or uh, stone, which he would take from forests that were being destroyed. And on these he would grow um, like Rupicola species, species of brown rock, many bromeliads and cactaceae, and he would, um, was inspired by nature. We have a day in Jardin Botanico, uh, Rio de Janeiro Botanic Garden, which is one of the oldest in Brazil. And uh, the collection is really impressive. They also had a really good Familiar house and a, an orchid house, which you can see in the picture. Uh, within these houses, the interpretation was really good. And it was in English as well, but uh, Portuguese and in English. And they, they had quite a lot written about each um, main genus of orchid that they were displaying. Um, so many of these are native to Brazil, such as Catlia, uh, Gracia, and Oncidium. And we were shown around the gardens by uh, Bruno Silva. 
who is the uh, curator of the Camellia collection at Rio. And uh, Bruno is also involved with some other interesting projects, and this is to his PhD, um, which is in green roofs in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is actually in one of the favelas, and he was able to grow over 200 species in one year on just one roof in the favelas. And he's developed a new method for doing this. Rather, rather than using any substrate, he actually uses five millimeter thick geotextile membrane. And um, these kind of Brazilian epiphytic plants uh, lend themselves really well to this. And it has several add-on effects. So it can reduce the temperature inside the houses to up to 10 degrees. And it can also mitigate noise pollution and, um, and air pollution. So finally, um, I've left this till last because it, it left, um, made the biggest impression. But it was the first garden that we went to. Um, it's called Inio Team. It was uh, founded by this mining entrepreneur, Bernardo de Mello Paz. And um, it's a combination of botanic garden and also art center. So you have these um, enormous contemporary art pieces, art galleries, and these are surrounded by botanical collections. We were shown around the garden by Giuliano Burin. Um, some of you may know Giuliano. He worked at the Eden Project for three years. Um, he did do a week's work experience at Kew and a master's up in Bambi University. The gardens are um, 140 hectares of visiting area, and this is also surrounded by um, 145 hectare private reserve, which isn't accessible for the public. Um, so I've got incredible amount of species. I think it's actually the, the most amount of species for any Brazilian garden. And um, 1,400 species of palm, which um, I believe is in the top three palm collections in the world. These are some of the um, art pieces that I mentioned. It's difficult to kind of put across the scale of these. What the most impressive thing for me was just how, how like, unbelievably big they were. Um, I won't explain the meaning behind any of them, but um, it's just to kind of set the scene, give you an impression of what it's like. And the garden is also involved with a number of different conservation initiatives. Um, they have their in situ reserve of um, semi deciduous Atlantic rainforest flora and also uh, patches of cerrado. They're growing a number of threatened and rare species um, in their ex situ collections and they're also doing a lot to raise awareness um, amongst the general public. They work with over 20,000 school children each year and um, also run several kind of adult workshops. So they're actually, um, in a similar way to Q, uh, their funding has become quite limited from the original sources, from the government and from uh, Bernardo, so they're looking at ways to raise money. And they have several festivals across the course of the year, um, art festivals, music festivals, and they can also sell plants which they grow in the nursery. Um, they're currently installing a seed bank and um, developing some PhD students developing cultivation protocols. So um, you see germination and looking at the best kind of soil to grow these plants in to enhance the capacity to, uh, to reintroduce this at some point in the future. So when I was there, we were shown around, again by Giuliano, who showed us some of the many um, art galleries. I had to do a talk um, for about half an hour to, to the staff there. Um, this was translated by Giuliano. So each, each slide I would say something, then he would say something after me. And it felt like he was saying a lot more than me as well, so that was, that was really good. Um, we also got to work in the gardens for, for a day. So we uh, lifted some familiars, did some dividing, and uh, just general tidy up. And that concludes my talk. I um, just want to say it was an incredible experience. Um, I think we managed to
to complete all the objectives that I set out at the start, and I would, I would certainly do something similar again. Um, thank you for listening.